Do we have any Dr. Seuss fans in the house? Any fans? Uh, what's your favorite Dr. Seuss book? Cat in the Hat? Anybody? Okay. Uh, Redfish, Go Fish. Uh, ooh. Redfish, Blue Fish, One Fish, Two Fish. Is that something like that? Yeah. Uh, mm, there you go. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Oh, yes, the Lorax. Yes, I speak for the trees. Uh, what's the other one? Oh, Horton Hears the Who, right? The very last book that Dr. Seuss wrote before his death in 1990 was called Oh, the Places You'll Go. And uh, I think it is an appropriate book not only for children, but for adults as well. So I wanted to read an excerpt for you from Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. You'll see the words on the screen. He says this, You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darker. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right or right in three quarters or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple, it's not. I'm afraid you will find. For a mind maker upper to make up his mind. Anybody resonate with that? We've spent the last couple of weeks in this series called vocari, and that word is the Latin word which means calling. And we get our English word vocation from that Latin word, and often when we use the word vocation, we're thinking about what? A job, an occupation. But there's more to that word than just a job. We're talking about calling, or another way that we talk about it here at Vintage is we think about flourishing. We're talking about meaningful purpose. And when you think about calling or meaningful purpose, one of the most difficult things things about a calling is making a decision, or as Dr. Seuss put it, a mind maker upper, right? So the last two weeks, we have answered two very important questions. You're going to see them on the screen. We first talked about identity, and when we talked about identity, we answered the question, who am I? Last week, we went from identity to purpose, and we answered the question, what am I made to do? Looking at that big word, calling, or the idea of purpose. And I want to remind you where you can find all of our resources the last couple of weeks, as well as um, some other resources. There's a QR code that you're going to see on the screen, and I've got another book recommendation for you today. It's a play on Dr. Seuss's book. It's by John Ortberg, he's a former pastor, and the title of the book is All the Places to Go, How Will You Know? Subtitle, God has placed before you an open door, what will you do? Anybody got any major life decisions that they need to make soon and they're trying to figure out what that decision is? Here you go. You ready? Excellent. Great book. We're going to talk about it a little bit today. So the question today, if we're thinking about purpose, is moving from what's that big purpose, what's that meaningful purpose, what's that calling, to now thinking about assignment, or to put it like this in a question, how am I to do it? So last week, what am I made to do? Now we begin to decipher for ourselves how we live out that assignment. How am I 
to do it. If you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Acts. If you're new to the Bible, turn to the middle of it, go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you're there in Acts. And we've spent the last two weeks in this passage in verses 1 through 3 of Acts 13. I want to read that, and then we're going to go a little bit further into this passage as we think about assignment today. So Acts 13, this is our anchor text for Vocari. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the what? For the work to which I have what? Called them. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Two things that I want to get to you today. The first one is this, as we think about assignment. His purpose is pursued through your assignments. Everybody say purpose. Everybody say assignments. His purpose, the Lord's purpose, is pursued through your assignments. Now, if you have your finger on Acts chapter 13, go down just a few verses to verse 13. Paul has begun his journeys, and I just want to read verses 13 through 16 of Acts chapter 13. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Pathos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. Side note, two different Antiochs that we're talking about here. The one Antioch is in Syria, that's where Paul just came from. This Antioch is in Turkey, modern day Turkey. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said. You can read what Paul said. But as we think about assignments, what I want you to think about related to Paul is this. Paul's assignment began with the Jews. It began with the Jews. Now, this is important for you to understand. It's important because of what Paul's calling or what Paul's purpose was. God had called Paul to be, in our modern day terms, a missionary, an evangelist, to share the gospel with the known world. Now, this isn't a trick question, question for you. What was Jesus? Was Jesus a Gentile or a what? He was a Jew, right? So Jesus was a Jew. Was Paul a Gentile or was Paul a Jew? Jew. So Paul is a Jew. Jesus is a Jew. What Paul understood is that the gospel, the thing that he was called by God to declare to the world, started with a Jewish man. In fact, the way that Paul wants you to understand the gospel is we're not talking about two different things. We're not talking about an old covenant or what we call the Testament, Old Testament, and a new covenant, or new covenant or a New Testament. He's talking about the same story, just two different chapters in that story. So what Paul understood and what he wants you to understand and me to understand is that Jesus is just the fulfillment of that old story. Therefore, it makes sense that Paul would start his assignment with Jews because they were familiar with the old story. They understood everything from Genesis to Malachi. They understood that the old story was pointing forward to a new character in the new story. Does this make sense? So Paul would begin by going to the synagogues, because what's in the synagogue? 
Jews. And he would begin his assignment basically telling them, listen, this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who came to the earth, put on flesh, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose from the grave, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the story that you've been reading, you've been studying, you've been believing in. Follow me? That's why, for Paul, his assignment always started in the synagogue, and with the Jews. In fact, he describes all of this in the book of Romans. If you're familiar with the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 9 through 11, those are three kind of complicated chapters in the book of Romans and in the New Testament itself, but he describes some of this relationship between Jew and Gentile. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 through 5. He says, they are Israelites, And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Again, he's saying all the old covenant, all the old story, it belongs to the Jews. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, the fulfillment of the old story, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So Paul's just simply saying, like, we have to start here. We start with the Jews because the story begins with the Jews. Now, in order to make this fit for us, for us to understand how do we take what was going on with Paul 2,000 years ago into our world, I want to remind you of a definition I gave you last week about our meaningful purpose or the way Doug Koskela in his book Calling and Clarity describes it, a missional calling. You're going to see it on the screen. Your missional calling is a way of acknowledging that God has wired you to serve in a particular sustained way over a lifetime. A particular sustained way over a lifetime. Now, I want you to think about it like this. School has begun, and all the parents said... Amen. But you can also be praying for me with the start of school. That means the dreaded H word, (laughs) homework. And Gabe is moving on to seventh grade math. And I have a feeling I'm going to be watching a lot of YouTube videos this fall and spring. But one of the things I'm really excited about is Dr. Turner gets to go back into the classroom this fall. I'm going to be teaching an undergraduate theology course at the seminary on Christian doctrine. And one of the first things that you have to do when you're teaching a class is you have to have a what? A syllabus, right? How many of you get excited on syllabus day when you see the syllabus and you're like, yes, look at all the reading and all the assignments and all the quizzes and all the tests. The the syllabus gives you... A path. It tells you what the class is and how to take the class and pass the class. Imagine if you walked into the classroom and you knew that you were taking, I don't know, trigonometry. And there was no syllabus to tell you what you were supposed to read, what your homework was supposed to be, what the course objectives would be, when the tests would be, what's the chance that you're going to pass that class? Yeah. And and more importantly, right, because as an educator, I want to remind you it's not about the grade. Right? It's about the experience and growing and learning. and all. I believe that, okay? You wouldn't have a clue about what you're learning. Same way as we think about calling. Right? You might have your purpose. You might know that your purpose, that sustained life purpose, you might know what it is. But if you are unaware of the assignments connected to that purpose... It is nearly impossible for you to live out that purpose. Paul understood that his calling in life was to take the gospel to the nations. 
But he also understood that that assignment begins with taking the gospel to the Jews. Now, what does that look like for you? What does that look like for me? We all might have different assignments in life. I want to encourage you to keep an open mind as you think about assignments. Yes, that assignment might be a job. That assignment that's connected to that purpose you have might be the nine to five job that you work. It might not be the actual job. It might be the relationships that you are building in the workplace. Or maybe you might have a job, but your real purpose in life is connected to the church and what the church does. And you have a particular assignment within the church. Just side note and side plug, right? V teams, right? Maybe an assignment, I'm just saying. You might have a particular relationship. If you're a parent, your, your purpose and assignments might be played out in raising your children. If you have friends, your purpose and assignment might be lived out in loving and encouraging and supporting your friends. Do you see where I'm going here? If you live in a particular community, your purpose and your assignments might be lived out in how you serve and lead in that community. What I want you to get and what I want you to understand is that I don't think we should box in ourselves when it comes to our purpose or our assignments. We shouldn't immediately begin to think that our purpose must be our job or that our assignments must be our job, but I want us to think more broadly Last week, I talked about how Paul was a tent maker, right? And when Paul was making tents, that was not his calling. It was just a vehicle for him to live out his calling. He was able to go different places all over the world, making money by making tents so that he could share the gospel with Jews and Gentiles all over the known world. Your story could be very similar. Your calling is his purpose pursued through your assignments. Second thing I want you to get is this. His purpose rarely changes, but your assignments can. His purpose rarely changes, but your assignments can. Keep moving in Acts chapter 13, and I want to look at Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 49. Paul's in the same place. He's in Antioch in Pisidia, and he's been in the synagogue proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, and look at what happens. Verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. And they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, first to the Jews. Since you thrust it aside and judge it yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are, very important word, what? We are what? Turning. Behold, we are turning to the who? The Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spread throughout the whole region. Paul's assignment began with the Jews but Paul's assignment changed with the Gentiles. 
This is very common in Paul's ministry. In fact, if you go and you read the rest of the book of Acts, you are going to find this happening time in and time out, where Paul goes into a city, he enters the synagogue, because again, that's what he was most familiar with. They were familiar with the story. He'd preach the gospel. Depending on how that turned out, he would then turn to who? The Gentiles. And I want you to pay close attention to the word in verse 46, turning. This word is so interesting and so important in this story. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. The word means to shift or to literally turn around. I think about it like what? To change direction. It's also a passive verb which means that the turning is being done to them. Now, just, you know, off the top of your head, who do you think's turning Paul and Barnabas? The Lord, the Holy Spirit, right? They've been one place, and now God is shifting them, turning them around to do something else, a different, similar purpose, same purpose, different assignment. In fact, the... The scripture that Paul quotes in verse 47 is Isaiah 49.6. And it says, the Lord has commanded us. So not only does Paul say, like, it's passive. God is the one who's turning us. But then he quotes Isaiah to say, no, it is the Lord that is changing this assignment. And again, to go back to the book of Romans, I want you to understand how Paul understood his mission and his assignments. Look at what he says in Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the who first? And also to the Greek, or right in Gentile. Every person who's non-Jew. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. Again, these are in those three chapters where Paul's describing the relationship between Jew and Gentile. He says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, what Paul is saying is like, look, my mission, my meaningful purpose in life is clear. I am called to do what? Tell people about Jesus. That Jesus is God and came to earth and put on flesh, lived a sinless life, and yet went to the cross, died for the sins of humanity, taking on that sin, taking on that punishment, but didn't stay dead, rose from the grave, giving life to us through his resurrection. Paul said, that's my message. That's what I proclaim. And I'm going to proclaim it to the Jew first because it is a fulfillment of what they believe. But when they reject it, God changes my assignment and turns me to the Gentile next. Because salvation is for the Jew and the Gentile. That's how Paul understood his assignment. One of the words that I've tried to white out of my vocabulary is the word pivot. I don't know if you remember. I know there's the Friends episode, right? But uh, in the heat of COVID... It seemed like everybody was talking about pivoting. Like we've got to pivot. We've got to change. We've got to pivot. It's the same mission, but we've got to pivot how we do it. And after a while, I'm just like, y'all are crazy, right? Like, yes, I know we've got to change, but I'm tired of pivoting. I've pivoted like a hundred times. I can't pivot this leg anymore, (laughs) right? There's a reality that we do sometimes have to pivot our assignments, and that the Lord is the one who does that. I would encourage you to think about these changes in micro changes and macro changes. Some of us, we make very minor micro changes to the way that we live out our assignment. 
Again, take for example me. This semester, I'm, I'm teaching a course. I'm not, I'm not changing my career. In fact, I would, I would think that my calling, my purpose is to equip people. I do that almost every Sunday here with you, and now I get to do that in the classroom teaching theology to, to level college students. That's a, that's a micro change. But think about, because it's so fresh, and I asked his permission today, think about Pastor Weaver. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt, think about Matthew Weaver. <laughs> right, so I want to make that clear, right? Think about Matthew Weaver, our former pastor here at Vintage. He went from being a pastor to a teacher. Now, he would tell you, and I agree, that his purpose has not changed. But the assignment by which he lives out that purpose has changed. I would make the argument that that's a micro shift, or a macro shift, sorry, a macro shift in his purpose and assignment. All of us, as we think about how God has wired us and what assignments look like, we have to be able to recognize when God is calling us to a micro shift, where it's just a little tweak, and when he might be changing our assignment in a big way. But also, we've got to be careful to recognize how those assignments, whether it's micro or macro, continue to align with that sustained life purpose that he's called us to. Your calling is his purpose pursued through your assignments. Lastly, I want to get to the nuts and bolts of this and give you guys some tips. How do I discern when God is changing my assignment? A few things. Number one, use wisdom. We just spent our entire summer in the book of Proverbs talking about wisdom. I want to encourage you in a couple quotes from the book that I recommended to you guys earlier, John Ortberg's All the Places to Go, and he says this, and I think this is like the opposite of wisdom that he's trying to get at. Sometimes when I desperately want God's will, what I really want isn't God's will at all. What I really want is what I want. Anybody testify to that? Or, this is, this is me, this is me for sure, it's to offload the anxiety of decision making. It's like, God, if you will just give me a burning bush, a pillar of fire, a cloud, then I will know what decision I'm supposed to make. When really what God wants to do is he wants to give you wisdom to make a wise decision. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy but it's going to be a wise decision. Again, John Orberg says it like this, God wants us to learn to choose well. Use wisdom. Number two, watch for open and closed doors. This one's weird. I get it because it's like, well, I don't, what's, what's a closed door? What's an open door? I don't see any doors. I don't know why I have that voice, but <laughs> maybe that's, when I think about you guys thinking about open and closed doors, that's the voice that comes to my mind, you know? When I was finishing my PhD in 2016, I was wrestling with open and closed doors because the thing that I wanted to do, I had just spent four years of my life studying and researching and writing a book and just drained from this work. And the reason I wanted to do this is because I wanted to teach. And there was a part of me, like the deepest desire that I wanted in my heart was to no longer be a pastor and be a professor. That's what I wanted. And as I processed that, wrapping up, graduating, still being a pastor here at Vintage, I wrestled with those open and closed doors. Because there were two things happening. No, number one, no one was asking Dr. Turner to be a full-time professor, you know? And then number two, for whatever reason, I did not feel like I could leave Vintage Church. 
as badly, not because I didn't like you people, love you people, but I just wanted a different assignment. And for whatever reason, the Lord closed doors and kept doors open. Now, here's the interesting piece in all of that. That was December 2016. In April of 2017, Pastor Rob, our founding pastor, comes to me and talks about how the Lord was calling him away. And immediately in that meeting, I felt a significant calling to become the lead pastor of Vintage Church. God's timing, right? Watch for open and closed doors. Number three, make a decision. Some of you are like, oh, I'm going to make the, I'm going to, ah. Listen to what John Ortberg says. Choosing doors always involves a process. I recognize opportunity, identify options, evaluate, choose, and learn. Now, my encouragement is for you to look at that and not think that those steps are, quote, unspiritual. Because I think each piece of those elements is spiritual. It's listening for the Holy Spirit. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to guide that process. And that's, that's how we get to a place where we're able to make a decision. Lastly, be bold. If you feel like the Lord is changing your assignment, take the step. Walk through the door. Do it. Is there a chance that you are wrong? Absolutely. Right? God's will is always hindsight. More often than not, we don't know what God's will was or is until we've walked through the door and we are able to recognize, yep, that was God's will. That's why John Ortberg talks about the last process of making a decision is what? To learn. But either way, when you're making the decision and you're changing an assignment, make the decision and be bold and do it. And in the process of being bold and living out this next assignment, seek the Lord, trust the Lord, use wisdom, look for open and closed doors, make a decision, be bold. You see where I'm going? It's a process over and over and over again. So like we've done every week, I want to give you just a prayer reflection, something for you to take in this moment and for you to process, but also for you to take throughout this week and use this as a prayer prompt. If you journal, this is a great question to write down and journal through this question this week. How are you to pursue your purpose? If your meaningful purpose, if your calling is clear, you're beginning to ask the question, what's my assignment? Maybe it's what's my assignments because there's more than one. What are they? Your calling is his purpose pursued through your assignments. May each one of us be faithful, not just to discern how God has called us, but also how we then actively live out the calling he's put on our lives through the assignments he's given us. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And again, Father, we are thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, for the message of the gospel shaping everything we're talking about going back to week one in this series about thinking about the question of identity and that for those of us who are in Jesus, each one of us has a calling. We thank you that you've given us a reason, a purpose, a meaning. But we're also thankful, God, for these assignments. That there are 
specific lanes we're meant to be running in, specific ways in which we're to be living out our calling. And I know for so many of us, maybe the challenge is trying to figure out, discern, understand, and know what those assignments are. So I pray for each one of us in this moment and throughout this week, God, that you would give us that wisdom that we need to help us discern the assignments you've called us to. Be with us now as we respond to you. We love you and we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' name.